G'day, this is Chris Savage from Our Real Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of the life of the Messiah from a Jewish perspective. I pray that it will be of benefit to you and help you in your Christian growth. Thank you for coming along. Okay, so this week we're looking at paragraphs 143 to 145. We're in the area of the official presentation of the king. And we last, last session, we'll do a quick recap. We had the testing of the lamb, uh, Jesus, the lamb of God. We, we know that the, the, the Passover lambs were to be tested for four days to ensure they were without spot or blemish. And just as those sacrificial lambs were tested, Jesus, the lamb of God, was also tested four times. A specific group in isolation or a combination of groups examined Jesus. First of all, the priests and the elders, and their specific question was one of authority. Jesus was preaching the gospel, and they questioned Jesus as to who gave him the authority to preach and teach. According to the rabbis, remember, authoritative teaching required previous, oops, previous rabbinic authorization. So they questioned Jesus, who had authorized you to teach? Which rabbi authorized you to teach? And also in their theology, a teacher should only teach what was handed down to him by his own teacher. The second testing was by the Pharisees and the Herodians. Herodians and the Pharisees, they attempted to provoke Jesus into doing or saying something that would then allow uh, them to charge him with sedition against Rome. And their specific question was, is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? The third group he was tested by were the Sadducees. And the Sadducees formulate a question that attempts to show how ridiculous the idea of resurrection is. Remember, they didn't believe in resurrection. One wife had seven husbands, six by a Leverite marriage. Eventually, she also dies. And a theological trick question that they asked Jesus was, in the resurrection, whose wife would she be? Since all seven brothers had at one time or another been married to her. And then the last testing was by the Pharisees on their own. And the man who launched the attack was a lawyer with expertise in the details of the law of Moses. Specific question was, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? What commandment is the first of all? Now, Jesus had been challenged four times, and each time he left them with no doubt as to his suitability as the spotless Lamb of God, because none of them could fault him in any matter. So he was spotless. He was without blemish. So we're in the situation. It's still Tuesday. And now we come to the denunciation of the leadership by Jesus. This lengthy paragraph, which we're looking at here, is covered by the three Gospels. Matthew is the most detailed of the three accounts, so we're going to focus more on him than the others because of that. And with this lengthy denunciation, Jesus will now close his public ministry, and he closes it three years after he began it at Passover time, and now again it's Passover time. Now after this, we're going to find him strictly alone with his apostles and other believers until his arrest and then we go into the trial, death, resurrection, and ascension. Because he says some pretty severe things against the leadership of that day, the, the, the anti-Messianic movement uh, uses this, those who are against Messiah, uh, Jesus as the Messiah. They use this, the, these passages to say that the New Testament is anti-Semitic. Look what terrible things Jesus says about the Jews, they say. First up. He's not saying terrible things about the Jews, but only about the Jewish leadership. And secondly, as we have seen in the past through the prophets like Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and several of the other minor prophets, those guys over and over again condemn the Jewish leadership for leading the nation astray and for bringing divine judgment upon them. So Jesus is not doing anything new. So this statement in Matthew 23 is very much a part of the prophetic tradition of the prophets of the Hebrew Bible. While the specific sins might be different, the principle remains the same. And the principle here is that the leadership is guilty of leading the nation astray. And therefore, they are responsible for bringing judgment upon that nation 
And furthermore, we're going to see that judgment comes upon the nation because the nation, the, the individuals in that nation, chooses to blindly follow its leaders. And as it was true in the Old Testament, so it's true in the New Testament. And it's the exact same thing today. So this discourse will be Jesus' last public statement and his public earthly ministry comes to an end. And there are three main sections we're going to look at. We're going to look at where he speaks to the disciples and the multitudes. Then he speaks to the Pharisees. And then we see his lament and the precondition to the second coming. That there is the, the, the beam, uh, that is the seat of Moses. And we're going to see Jesus speaking about that now. This section is to the disciples and the multitudes. We find it in Matthew 23, 1 to 12, Mark 12, 38 to 40, and Luke 20, 45 to 47. Jesus has now silenced the Pharisees. This is, sorry, last session, he, he silenced the Pharisees with the question about David's son. And that was back in Matthew 23, verse 1. He said five things to the multitudes and to his disciples about the Pharisees. This is where we are today. First, first thing he says, Jesus says the Pharisees' true nature was characterized by hypocrisy. We see that in verses 1 to 3 of Matthew 23. All things, therefore, whatsoever they bid you, these do and observe, but do not you after their works, for they say and do not. So if we look at verse 2 of Matthew 23, this has been a misunderstood verse. The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So there are elements, again, in the anti-Messianic movement that uses to say that we ought to obey what the rabbis are saying because Jesus says we ought to obey them. Now, they interpret this to mean according to their religious Pharisaic laws, remember, according to their oral traditions. But we, what we have seen so far over and over that Jesus often disobeyed their Pharisaic laws. In fact, sometimes he even goes out of his way to break it, as we saw, remember the healing of the man, of the blind man, the man born blind? If what he's saying is that we have to obey rabbinic laws, well, Jesus can be accused of hypocrisy because he broke them. Remember, uh, rabbinic laws, uh, the oral laws, the traditions of the elders, they're man-made laws. They're not, they're not the laws from Moses. They're not God's written laws. Now, in this verse in Matthew 23, Jesus' statement must be understood in the writings of that day in first century Israel. Seat of Moses was a literal seat. It's also called the throne of the Torah, made of wood or stone and placed at the entrance of the town synagogue. And just as Moses sat when judging Israel, the local judge would sit upon this seat as litigants stated their cases before him just like today's civil course, and if they decide civil matters. After they present their case, the judge sitting on the seat decides uh, the verdict based upon case law. And these judges had the authority to apply case law in specific civil situations, not religious. However, they did not, have, again, they did not have that authority in religious laws that had to be obeyed. It wasn't theirs. It was just civil law. Jesus simply recognized their authority to decide the application of case law in specific civil situations. And on these issues, their uh, decisions were considered final. Uh, just the same today, if a judge in court passes a, give, gives a sentence, both parties, okay, we'll, we'll put up with that. Now, when the Pharisees sat as judges on Moses' seat and issued a verdict based, based upon case law, both parties had to obey whether they agreed with the verdict or not. Moses' seat, though, was not for the purpose of applying new man-made religious laws. The Pharisees went beyond this model because they created new burdensome laws. So this passage cannot be used to teach that believers today must observe orthodox Judaic rules, since Jesus neither obeyed them nor obligated believers to obey these laws. God did not give any such authority to men or to them, to these Pharisees. Second thing, it says that they had laid the burden of the Mishnah, which is, which is what we're talking about, the traditions of the elders, the oral law, 
they had laid this burden on others while they themselves had found ways of getting around it. We see this in verse 4 of Matthew 23. Yea, they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders. Remember back in paragraph 85, we talked about binding and loosing in rabbinic theology. The term bind means forbid. So the many religious prohibitions that they added to the Mosaic law actually turned it into a burden rather than a joy. It, it was so heavy. But Jesus goes on to say that, but they themselves will not, will not move them with their finger. Now, Jesus never asks us to do anything that he has not first done. But the Pharisees commanded, but they did not participate. Do as I say, not as I do. They were hypocritical religious dictators. They were not spiritual leaders. So the second thing is that they are, uh, they are guilty of making the Mishnah a burden on others. The third thing we see here is that the Pharisees were characterized by self-seeking and self-righteousness. Their motivation was wrong and prideful. And Jesus gives us two examples. He says they might broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments in verse 5. Phylacteries are, are also known as tefillin. Uh, the little you see the little boxes that the Orthodox Jews, they bind them to their foreheads and uh, also have them on their left arms, uh, tied to their left arms in obedience to Deuteronomy 6 verse 8. Inside the box is a little parchment in which are written three passages of the Mosaic Law. Uh, Exodus 13, 3 to 16, Deuteronomy 6, 5 to 9, and Deuteronomy 11, 13 to 21. Now, because uh, of, the, of the Pharisees' self-seeking and self-righteousness, the they had made these boxes broad or oversized so that everyone could see who they were. They went beyond the requirements of the Mosaic law. They also enlarge the borders of their garments. Now, what's that about? We have tassels on the fringes of their garments, uh, the, the zitziot. Uh, this was in keeping with the commandments uh, of the Mosaic law in Deuteronomy 22.12, even, the even to the point of having one of those uh, tassels blue. That was part of the Mosaic law. The act was correct. They had to have these things. But what was he condemning him here for? First of all, they had made them unusually long. And secondly, to be seen of men. Why? So as to glory in them. Look at me, look at me. Now, when they did obey the Mosaic law, their motivation was wrong. Why? Because the motivation for obeying uh, Mosaic, the commandments of the Mosaic law was to love God and to show our love of God. Why do we today obey the law of Messiah? To show our love for him. Because he, he, very, he said in John, John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's the proper motivation for obedience of commandments because of our love for the Messiah or our love for God. But they followed these commandments just to be seen of men. And that's where the motivation was wrong. They were self-seeking and self-righteous. And Luke added a, a couple of additional details about the hypocrisy. Uh, because it says that Luke says that they desired to walk in long robes. That's Luke 20, verse 46. Uh, and there, these long flowing robe was, a, was part of a fancy and expensive wardrobe that they had. A scribe's robe had a long mantle reaching to the feet and it was, it was decorated with long fringes, the, the, the zitziot. And they also loved salutations in the marketplaces oh rabbi rabbi according to the talmud such greetings were required for teachers of the law but jesus had earlier rebuked pharisees for this practice right back in luke chapter 11 verse 43 furthermore it goes on to say in luke 20 verse 46 that they they sought the chief seats in the synagogues so these were places of honor and this likely refers to the rows of seats in the, in the synagogues which were closest to the ark. And the ark, or the, the Aaron Kadesh, that's where the Torah scrolls uh, are kept. 
and that's considered to be the holiest place in the synagogue. So these guys, they wanted to sit as close as they could to the holiest place in the synagogue. Uh, that's why they're eager to sit in the chief places at feasts, chief places, uh, which we see here. To sit next to the host during a, a banquet was an honor, and the Pharisees loved these seats. Why? To be seen of men. This was all denounced by Jesus back in Luke 11, verse 43. Fourth thing we see here is that the Pharisees loved man-exalting titles and wanted to be called rabbi, teacher, father, and master. Uh, and Matthew tells us it's in Matthew 23, verses 7 to 10. These were four titles which were used in the teacher-pupil relationship. Now, he is not talking about a biological father relationship, but a student-teacher relationship. The Pharisees went after these man-exalting titles, not simply because of status, but because when they, received, when they received these titles, it gave them, gave them a tremendous amount of undue authority over the decision-making process of their individual disciple in matters totally unrelated to his discipleship. Like, where does he work? Who does he marry? By having these titles, these guys had this authority over his disciple. And it was because of this authority that they went after these man-exalting titles. See, these titles were not an office or, or a position or a function or a job description. It was much more than that. In fact, when one received the title of rabbi or father, master or teacher, he was to be looked upon as the most important person in a disciple's life. In fact, uh, the Mishnah taught that if one was faced with the choice that one had to ransom their father or their teacher or their rabbi, they should ransom their teacher first, and then after they've ransomed the teacher, they can then go and try and find some money to ransom their father. Yet uh, it wasn't all rabbis that uh, considered this exalted position the highest good. Uh, as we see a, a statement from the Talmud proves, it says, he who humbles himself for the sake of the Torah in this world is magnified in the next. He who makes himself a servant to the study of the Torah in this world becomes free in the next. Now, that's in the Talmud. And this was a statement by Rabbi Jeremiah, and that was the proper motivation. Uh, and this is this is very uh, this is Jesus's view of leadership and discipleship because Jesus himself said, "Whosoever shall exalt himself shall be humbled; whosoever shall humble himself shall be exalted." And that's in Matthew twenty-three verse twelve. So this was not the prevalent view in first-century Judaism to humble yourself. In Mark twelve verse forty. Uh, this is the fifth thing in Mark 12, verse 40. It says, they that devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers, these shall receive greater condemnation. The Pharisees were guilty of prostituting their religion because by means of their prayers, they actually uh, disguise their covetousness. Under the Mosaic law, uh, back in uh, Exodus 22, um, 22 to 23, widows were given special protection. They were to be looked after, cared for. Now, because of this protection, a Pharisee who took a widow's home as a pledge for a debt, which he knew she couldn't, could never repay, but he still took it anyway, would never foreclose on her home until he prayed about it first. So when they foreclosed on widows' homes, after they'd loaned their money to pay a debt, which they knew that these widows could never repay the debt, after they prayed over these houses, before they foreclosed, they always made sure that they prayed first. And then they took the house. When James defined uh, pure religion in, in James chapter 1, 26 to 27, he included their taking care of widows. So mere prayer could not acquit the Pharisees for their failure. They were not very good people. Now, 
That was talking to his disciples and, and the, the believers. He's now talking to the Pharisees. And we find this in, in Matthew 23, verses, six, uh, verses 13 to 36. He pronounced seven words upon the Pharisees. And these seven words are for a variety of sins, but they actually move in a circle. In the first word, he gives a general introduction. And in the conclusion, the seventh word elaborates upon the first word in greater detail. The first word we find in Matthew 23, verse 13. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut the kingdom of heaven against men. For you enter not in yourselves, neither do you allow those who are entering in to enter. In the first word against the Pharisees, Jesus condemned them because first up, they rejected his Messiahship. And secondly, they were leading the nation to the rejection of his Messiahship as well. That's the first, first word. Second word, verse 15, you compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he's become one, so you make him twofold more a son of hell than yourselves. This word is for turning proselytes to Pharisaic Judaism into a much worse condition. Because often what happened was these Gentile converts to Pharisaic Judaism actually became more zealous religiously uh, than the Pharisees themselves. So instead of saving souls, they were condemning souls. Remember, Jesus called the Pharisees the sons of the, de of the devil, children of the devil, back in chapter 8, verse 44 of John. Third word, condemn the Pharisees for switching priorities by focusing on the consecrated rather than the one who consecrate. We, we see this in Matthew 23, verses 16 to 22. You blind guides that say, whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he's a debtor. So if you made a vow based upon the temple, one didn't have to keep it. But if one made a vow based upon the gold of the temple, then one was obligated to keep that vow. This is what the Pharisees taught. The gold was special only because of where it was. Priority was given to the consecrated rather than that which consecrates it. The temple was what sanctified the gold. The gold did not sanctify the temple. So the rabbi's priority was misdirected. Second example he gives us is, whosoever uh, shall swear by the altar, it is nothing, but whosoever shall swear by the gift that is, up, that is upon it, he's a debtor. What they're saying is that making an oath on the basis of the altar did not obligate the person to keep it. However, swearing on the basis of the sacrifice on the altar obligated one to keep the oath. And we see this in verse 18 of Matthew 23. Yet the, the, the sacrifice, the gift, was unique only because it was on the altar. It was because of the altar that the gift was actually special. In fact, the animal was no different to any other animal. But if one swore by the gift, he had to keep it. If one swore by the altar that made the gift special, it didn't matter. These men were not seeking for the righteousness of God. They were greedy for gain. The fourth woe condemned the Pharisees for focusing on minor things while ignoring major things. And this is verses 23 to 24 of Matthew 23. For you tithe mint and anise and cumin the three smallest seeds in Israel in the first century. Mosaic law did require tithing of the harvest, but not necessarily the tithing of the smallest herbs. In, in fact, the Talmud states that tithing of herbs is from the rabbis. It's an oral law rather than a specific Mosaic commandment. Tithing herbs by itself was not wrong because Jesus goes on to say, but these you ought to have done. The problem was what they left undone, justice, mercy, and faith. It's, uh, it's usually the case that, you know, the, the legalists uh, are stickler for the fine details, but they're blind to the great principles. So these three elements were far more important than tithing even the, the smallest seed, justice, mercy, and faith. So the Pharisees were guilty of focusing on the minors and ignoring the majors. The fifth woe, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, 
for you cleanse the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full from extortion and excess. You blind Pharisee, cleanse first the inside of the cup and of the platter, that the outside thereof may become clean also. So here, Jesus condemned the Pharisees for being far more concerned with the external demands of the law than the internal demands of the law. They wash the outside of the cup, but leave the inside where the food was still dirty with rotting food. They'll eat again from the inside of the cup, so the old will corrupt the new. Mosaic law required a balance between both external and internal conformity. Pharisees were careful to keep the outside very clean because why? That's what men see. And they wanted the praise of men. They live for reputation, not character. But God sees the heart within and he saw greed and self-indulgence. In the last three woes, Jesus called the Pharisees blind five times. Blind guides, you fools and blind Ye blind, uh, uh, verse 19, Matthew 23. You blind guides, verse 24. You blind Pharisees, verse 26. They were blind, spiritually blind. Six word condemned the Pharisees for the hypocr hypocrisy and compared them to whited sepulchers. This is in verses 27 to 28, Matthew 23. Now, sepulch sepul sepulchers are tombs, tombstones. And every year, uh, especially around Passover, these tombs were whitewashed so that they would be easy, easily seen. Uh, Mosaic law forbade anyone who was of the tribe of Levi, especially the, the, the Cohens, the priestly line, to come into contact with a grave or, or a tomb. And the Pharisees were told by Jesus that they were like the whitewashed sepulchers, white and clean on the outside where men see them, but inside, are full of dead men's bones, contaminated. And that's the nature of legalism. Obedience to man-made rules and regulations, whether they are Mishnah rules or church rules, might make a person look really religious and spiritual on the outside, but actually changes nothing on the inside. So the seventh woe elaborates now upon the first woe, the big circle. He's condemning the Pharisees for rejecting the prophet's testimony of the Messiah. And we find this in Matthew 23, 29 to 36. Verse 33. You serpents, you offspring of vipers, how shall you escape the judgment of hell? Therefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them shall you kill and crucify. Some of them shall you scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. Jesus' point here is that they will be held accountable for all the blood of the Old Testament prophets in addition to the rejection of his Messiahship. Why? Because everything that the Old Testament was going to say about the Messiah had now been said. And the Old Testament canon had now been closed for over four and a half centuries. It's all been said. To reject Jesus as the Messiah automatically included the rejection of the testimony of the prophets. No one claiming to believe the prophets can reject Jesus as the Messiah. Furthermore, they had the testimony of John the Baptist, and he was proclaiming the imminent appearance of the Messiah. And beyond that, they had the personal ministry of Jesus. He claimed to be the Messiah, and he authenticated his claims through many miracles, signs, and wonders. And some of these very miracles, even the Pharisees had previously taught, where miracles only the Messiah can do when he comes. Yet in spite of all this, they rejected his claim. Consequently, they're going to be held accountable for the written truth revealed to them. Now in this context, we see Jesus, he, he refers to two men, Abel and Zechariah in verse 35. And following the order of the Hebrew Bible, it, it, verse 35 here says, Upon you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of Abel, the righteous, unto the blood of Zechariah, son of Barakiah, whom you slew between the sanctuary and the altar. Now, the, the Hebrew Bible, it, it, the number of books in the Hebrew Bible is the same as the Christian Old Testament, uh, both the same number of books. But the Hebrew Bible has a different order. 
in both uh, the, the Christian Bible and the Hebrew Bible, Genesis is the first book. However, the last book in the Jewish scriptures in, in the Hebrew Bible is Second Chronicles, not Malachi. Uh, in our Christian Bible, Malachi is the last book. Now, uh, the first martyr recorded was in Genesis, and that was Abel, uh, which we find in, in Genesis 4, verse 8. This Abel in Genesis 4, verse 8. The last one recorded was Zechariah, the prophet, and we find that in Second Chronicles 24 to 22. Second Chronicles 24 to 22. So the Hebrew Bible ends with Second Chronicles, not Malachi. So by naming these two men, Jesus is saying everything from the beginning to the end of the Hebrew Bible, uh, you're going to be held accountable for. Now, the Jewish figure of speech indicated the whole body of revealed written truth. That's, that's what he's saying. Um, we would say Genesis to Revelation, whole, whole lot of God's word. Now, Jesus concludes his condemnation of the Pharisees by declaring, Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. That's Matthew 23, verse 36. The emphasis is again on the guilt of this specific generation, which was held accountable for committing the unpardonable sin of rejecting the whole body of revealed written truth and revealed, re rejecting the Messiah himself. Now we come to the lament, and we find this in Matthew 23, verses 37 to 39. Jesus is pronounced the seven words upon, upon the Pharisees, and, and while still speaking in the hearing of Israel's leadership, Jesus now concluded with a lament in these verses 37 to 39. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which kills the prophets and stones them that are sent to her, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth till you shall say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. So here in verse 37, we have the lament. It's a lament on the, uh, on the apparent failure of his messianic mission. Now, over the past three and a half years, he had longed to spread out his hands and give to Jerusalem the unique messianic protection promised by the prophets. But they would not accept him. They had rejected his claims. So we see in Matthew 23, verse 38, Behold, your house, now the house is a temple, is left to you desolate. It was destroyed 40 years later in AD 70. Then Jesus said to the leadership in verse 39, You will not see me again until you shall say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And with this official Messianic greeting based upon Psalm 118, verse 26. The point Jesus was making is crucial. He was saying that he would not return until the Jewish leaders asked him to return. This is the second coming, not the rapture. Just as the Jewish leaders once led the nation to reject him, a day must come when they will lead the nation to accept him. And this is, this is where we, we find the foundation for anti-Semitism. Satan has led, is leading, and will continue to lead a special war against the Jews in general, but in particular against Messianic Jews. Satan knows that his career will be over when the Messiah returns at the request of the Jewish people. If he could succeed in destroying the Jews before they plead for his return, then Jesus will not come back and Satan's career will be eternally safe. This explains the motivation for Satan's relentless war against the Jews. We have the Crusades, the Russian pogroms, the Nazi Holocaust. Today, we're seeing more and more people turning against the Jews, BDS, all these things. Once Satan is confined to the earth in the tribulation, which we see in Matthew, in uh, Revelation 12, verse 7 to 17, knowing his time is short, 
he's going to expend all of his energies trying to destroy the Jews once and for all. Anti-Semitism in any form, active or passive, whether it's political, national, racial, social, whatever it is, or other, it's all part of satanic strategy to prevent the second coming. After establishing the, the, the precondition to, for his return, Israel's national regeneration headed by the leadership of Israel, Jesus closed his public ministry, ending where it began in the temple compound. So with the rapture, there is no precondition. It could happen at any time. But for the second coming, the Jewish people have to ask him to come back. Now we go to the treasury. And we see this in, in Mark chapter 12, verse 41 to 44, and Luke 21, verses 1 to 4. So they're heading out of the temple, and then Jesus now sat for a while uh, by the treasury. Uh, and, and where the treasury is, there are 13 large boxes known as Corban chests, and that's where they're kept. Uh, and so he sat down over against the treasury, we see in, in Mark 12, verse 41. Uh, and by the 13 chests, he now gave his disciples a vivid picture of the distinction he had made between the external and the internal. They watched a lot of the wealthy people casting large amounts of money into the treasury. And Mark pointed out that many that were rich cast in much. Uh, this verse 41. Now, uh, if you remember uh, back in Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, Matthew 6, 1 to 4, it was customary for the rich, when they gave a big offering, they had a trumpet sound to highlight what they were about to do so everybody could see them putting this big wad of money into the treasury. However, a poor widow comes along and she only casts in two mites. And we see that in verse 42 of Mark 12 and verse 2 of Luke 21. Uh, during the first century, Jewish, Greek, and Roman coins circulated in Israel. In the Jewish coins, we had shekels, half shekels, quarter shekels, and a thing called a lepton. Uh, Luke and Mark call these last coins mites. This, the lepton, they call a mite. What's a mite? Well, it's made of copper, and they had the least value of all the coins. Uh, like our, we used to have a one-cent coin. I don't think we do have one. No, we used to have a one-cent coin here. It's, it's, it's like that. One cent coin. We don't know how old she was, but we know that she was poor. Uh, and what she gave was actually the legal minimum. You couldn't put in any less than two mites. Jesus, however, distinguished between the two types of gifts, noting here that the wealthy did cast in of their superfluity. Now, that's in verse 44 of Mark 12. They were so wealthy that, that what they gave neither hurt them nor did it affect their lifestyle, neither did it indicate that they trusted the Lord. But the widow, she comes along and she essentially gave everything that she had. She had to trust God to provide for her basic needs. Because Jesus actually said that she gave everything. She's, a, she's a, a, just a, a wonderful counterpoint to those upon whom Jesus has just pronounced these seven woes. She's a spot of faith and a light in the place where God was looking for it, and that was in his temple. Her offering was, was acceptable to the Lord and provided an object lesson of what Jesus had just taught his disciples, that true conformity to the law must be both internal and external, not simply external like the Pharisees. Now we come to the preparation for the death of the king, and this is going to go from paragraph 145 to paragraph 164. Uh, these paragraph numbers, these, uh, these follow Ariel's harmony of the Gospels, or it follows um, Ariel's harmony of the Gospels, which is based upon A.T. Robertson's uh, harmony of the Gospels. So this is now the eighth section, the eighth division uh, of the life of Messiah, and we have here a prophetic discourse from the king. And it's going to go right down onto the end with the agony of Gethsemane. This is the what we call the Olivet Discourse. Uh, and this is the prophecies of the king. We find this in Matthew 21, verse 1 to Matthew 25, verse 46. 
Mark 13, verse 1 to 37, and Luke 21, verse 5 to 38. Now, when Jesus uh, closed his public ministry, he clearly proclaimed that his return depended upon Israel's specific belief and their request. We just saw that. Previously, when he withdrew the offer of the Messianic kingdom, he promised to offer it again to a future generation. Uh, and that was back in Matthew 12 and 13. In Jericho, Jesus told his disciples that the kingdom would not immediately appear. We, we find this, uh, we, we, well, we found this in Luke 19, 11 to 28. In this section, Jesus is going to answer the question, what will be the circumstances that will cause Israel to call him back? This section also marks the end of Jesus' prophetic ministry. Uh, and, you know, we, we know theologians have said that uh, Messiah holds three offices, uh, those of prophet, priest, and king. Uh, however, as, as we know, he doesn't function in all three offices at the same time, uh, but sequentially. During his first coming, he held the position of a prophet. Remember, a prophet receives direct revelation from God, and then he proclaims God's will for his own generation, and he'll also predict future events, both near and far. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus proclaimed God's will for his own generation as he expounded on the righteousness of the Mosaic law. In this section, Jesus predicts future events, both near and far, and he presents these events in a basic chronological sequence, with the exception of two times, and, and he will it, be clearly indicate when those two times are not chronological. Now, with his ascension, Jesus' function as a prophet changed to that of a priest. He's presently the high priest in heaven, and he's, what's he doing? He's making intercession for you and I, for believers. So Jesus was a prophet. He is a priest, but he will be a king. Specifically, he'll be the king of the Jews and of the world, beginning at his second coming. The Olivet Discourse now deals with the circumstances that will bring about Jesus' functioning in this third office, the office of a king. And this book surveys the life of the Messiah presented in the four Gospels. So this, this, this is the, the harmony. So this section only deals with, with the basics of the Olivet Discourse or the prophecies of the king, rather than every detail uh, as uh, on eschatology. Okay. Historical setting. We see this in Matthew 24, verses 1 to 2, Mark 13, 1 to 2, and Luke 21, 5 to 6. It's still Tuesday, 12th of Nisan, April the 4th, 30 AD. Jesus, after he denounced the scribes and the Pharisees for leading the nation and rejecting him, he now spells out the precondition for his second coming. As he's left the temple for the last time, his disciples pointed out the buildings. It says in Matthew 24, verse 1, and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. And they were looking at the structure itself. Evidently, they were particularly focused upon the stones because, because they said, teacher, behold what manner of stones and what manner of buildings. Uh, we see that in Mark chapter 13, verse 1. And Luke also writes in his gospel, in Luke 21, verse 5, and as some spoke of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and offerings. Uh, now, Herod, Herod had begun restoring the temple and enlarging the temple compound back in the year 20 BC. This is now 30 AD. While the actual building was completed in a, in a, in a few months, um, the outer courts and structures were still under construction when this event takes place in AD 30. And, and it won't be completed until AD 64, just another 34 years away. Six years later in AD 70, what's going to happen? The whole temple compound was totally destroyed. Now, these stones are called Herodian stones or Herodian blocks, uh, and the largest stones used in construction in Israel in those days. They average about 10 to 12 feet, which is around about, what, four meters, something like that, uh, three and a half to four meters, and they weighed 
eight to 10 tons, heavy. Many of them were much larger and heavy. In fact, up to 400 tons per stone. Now today in Jerusalem, many of these stones are still visible, especially uh, on the south and west walls. Now, when the disciples pointed out the buildings, Jesus prophesied, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. That's in Matthew 24, verse 2. And this prophecy was fulfilled literally in AD 70. And the temple today, it still sits in room so that there's not one stone upon another. Three questions. Yeah, the disciples asked him three questions. And um, we're going to look at Matthew 24, verse 3. It's also in, in Mark 13, 3 to 4, and Luke 21, 7. Now, the Olivet Discourse is the result of some questions that the disciples asked when Jesus told them the temple would be destroyed. The apostles asked three questions, asking for the sign which would forewarn them of these things about to happen. And we have to look at both Matthew and Luke for the answers. Matthew observed, and as he sat on the Mount of Olives, verse 3, you remember, uh, a rabbi sits down to teach. That's what he's doing. Matthew stated now that the disciples asked Jesus to question. And Mark specifically stated that four disciples approached him, uh, the brothers Peter and Andrew, and the brothers James and John. Matthew worded the three questions this way. This is in Matthew 24, verse 3, second part of verse 3. Tell us, when, fell, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? Luke actually provides a little bit more detail about the nature of the first question concerning signs. Teacher, when therefore shall these things be? And what shall be the sign when these things are about to come to pass? That's, that's Luke 21, verse 7. So... Here are the three questions set out so we can up three for ease. First one, what is the sign of the coming destruction of Jerusalem and the temple? That's the first question. Second question, what is the sign of your coming or what is the sign the second coming is about to occur? Third question is, what is the sign of the end of the age? Now, remember uh, the Jews spoke of two ages, uh, this age, meaning the age, the present age, the age that we're in, and the age to come, which is the Messianic age. So what is a sign that this age is about to end and the age to come, the Messianic kingdom, is about to be established? Remember, the apostles did not understand the program of death and resurrection, nor the program of two comings. So they asked the questions based on what they understood at that time which was shaped by the Jewish eschatology that speaks of the present age as this age, messianic age, the age to come. They wanted to know, what do they want to know? When the current age would end and when the new messianic age began. They actually believed it was going to happen at Passover, at this Passover. Now, while the apostles asked their questions based on what they understood, Jesus answered them based on what would actually occur. Jesus doesn't answer the question in the order in which they are asked. Instead, he answered the third question first, the sign of the end of the age. The first question, second, destruction of the temple. And the second question, third, sign of the second coming. Also, not all three gospel writers recorded all of his answers to all three of the questions. Mark and Matthew both ignored Jesus' answer to the first question, while Luke chose to record it. Now, what are the general characteristics of the age between the two comings? And we find this in Matthew 24, 4 to 6, Mark 13, 5 to 7, and Luke 21, 8 to 9. So Jesus answered the third question first, both with a positive and a negative answer. He answered the question negatively, citing two elements which in no way indicates that the last days have begun. They are not signs of the last days. First, there will be the rise of false messiahs. Many shall come after me in my name, saying, I am the Christ. That's verse 5, Matthew 24. So first up, the rise of false messiahs. This is not a sign of the last days. 
In Jewish history, Jesus was the first person to claim to be the Messiah, followed by a long line of false messiahs, beginning with a man called Simon bar Kokhba, uh, the leader of the Second Jewish Revolt against Rome in AD 132 to 135. More recent false messiahs were a, were a man called Jacob Frank of Poland, 1726 to 1791. And then we had a man, a Menachem Schneerson, 1902 to 1994. Some of these men had a large worldwide following, uh, such as a Shabbatai V in the 17th century. Among the Gentiles, false messiahs arose throughout history as well, such as a man called Reverend Sun Young Moon. Yet none of them were prophetically significant or a sign of the last days. Second, the second characteristic of this age is you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Verse 6 of Matthew 24. This refers to local wars. But again, by itself, it's not prophetically significant. The entire church age will be characterized by local wars. So what are we going to have? Local wars, rise of false messiahs, are characteristics of the entire church age. They are not signs of the last days. And Jesus said that these things must needs come to pass but the end is not yet. The end is not yet. So they're not signs of the last days. They're simply characteristic of the church age. Now, the sign of the end of the age. Again, Matthew 24, 7 to 8, Mark 13, verse 8, Luke 21, 10 to 11. Jesus now answered the third question, the sign of the end of the age. In the Matthew account, Matthew 24, verses 7 to 8, we read, For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and earthquakes in diverse places, but all these things are the beginning of travail. Travail means birth pangs. The prophets of the Old Testament and also the prophetic accounts in the New Testament Picture the closing days as a series of birth pangs. And this is compared to what a woman goes through before giving birth to a child. The last days of this age would be like that, before the birth of the new age. First birth pang, the beginning of travail, would be when nation rises against nation and kingdom against kingdom. This is different from wars and rumors of wars. In the rabbinical literature of that day, the expression nation against nation will rise against nation and so on was a rabbinic idiom for a world war. What Jesus was saying was that while local wars did not indicate that the end had come, when a world war begins, that is the first sign of the end. Therefore, the end of this age has begun. Now, Dr. Fruchtenbaum quotes two other more or less contemporary sources which use the same motif. First quotation is, at that time, wars should be stirred up in the world, nation shall be against nation, and city against city. Much distress shall be renewed against the enemies of the Israelites. And the second quotation is, if you shall see kingdoms rising against each other in turn, then give heed and note the footsteps of the Messiah. So the expression kingdom against kingdom, nation against nation, is a Hebrew idiom for a world war. And when we see a world war, Jesus said that that would be the sign that the end of this age has begun. We're living in the last days. It is not since 1948 with the reestablishment of the Jewish state, as some people argue. It, wasn't, it didn't start then. That is nowhere marked as the beginning of the end times in scripture, but rather World War I of 1914 to 1918 was the first sign of the last days. For all practical purposes, World War II, which was 1939 to 45, was simply a continuation of World War I, and both world wars had a very significant effect upon the Jews. As a result of World War I, we had the impetus of the Zionist movement 
It gained a foothold, gained a hold. As a result of World War II and the Holocaust, the Jewish state was reestablished in 1948 after nearly 1900 years since the Romans crushed Israel in AD 70. This was another birth pang. Jerusalem falling on the Jewish control in 1967 is another birth pang. To see a nation come back into existence after nearly 1900 years is a huge miracle, setting the stage for the fulfillment of prophecy and the return of the Lord when the nation's religious leaders shall say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We, you know, in, in, having been born into this era, often fail to recognize the, the, the enormity of the miracle of Israel's rebirth. Bible scholars only 100 years ago used to allegorize the prophecies regarding Israel because they, they could never envision Israel coming back as a nation. In regard to famines, there have been many severe ones in the 20th century. In 1920, uh, there was a, this is all part of what Jesus was talking about, the, the, you know, the signs, famines, uh, earthquakes, uh, pestilences, pestilence, but we got one now. In 1920, there was a famine in China where millions died. In 1921, famine in Russia where millions died. We've also seen more recent famines in our lifetime, Ethiopia, uh, places like that. Uh, food shortages in the third world uh, are becoming commonplace. Um, earthquakes, well, uh, steadily increasing number of them. Uh, I mean, we, we have more recording of them today, but also as we look at Jesus's words, they are a sign of the beginning of the end time. So the, we are in the end days. They have started with, with uh, World War I. That was the start. And that is our lot for today. Uh, our contact details are there. Uh, feel free to contact us. Thank you for coming along tonight.